Hi. Put a bag on your head. All right. Oops, what happened here? Oh. Let me minimize this real quick. All is going according to plan, my friends. Cool. Can everybody see my screen? I'm seeing some head nods. Okay. This is our talk today. American ginseng, ecology, history, site selection, and production methods. Um, I guess we'll both introduce ourselves. Andrea, you're going first. Uh, my name is Andrea Miller. I'm the Sustainable Forestry Program Manager here at Rural Action in Athens, Ohio. Hi, I'm Badger Johnson. I serve as the Climate Resilience Coordinator for Rural Action, and I am also based in Athens. Oops. Next slide. Okay, um, I'll do the outline, then Andrea is going to do the first half of this presentation, then I'll do the second half. So um, uh, let's hear from at least three people. Um, more people can uh, also contribute to answering this question. But uh, raise your hand, please. Andrea will call on you by name um, and say why you're here and uh, uh, what you hope to get out of this um, workshop. And also, if you have any forest farming experience, you could say something very briefly about that. Badger, it would be great if you could call on people. Since I'm sharing my screen, I can only see the person talking. OK. Thank you. Yeah, this is a good opportunity to practice the raise your hand feature. <laughs> um, I see Shane raising your hand. Go ahead, Shane. Thanks, Badger. Um, I am here because I hope to own property one day in the near future, and I would like for non-timber forest products such as ginseng to be part of my like long-term like diversified portfolio. Um, so I'm here for knowledge and information. Awesome. We will. We can hopefully hopefully get you started with that. All right. I need two more people before I feel good moving on. So some other people. Hi. How about me? I've been planting stuff. Uh, who's speaking? I can't see a hand Paul. raised. Paul. Okay. There we go. Paul, yeah. I've been probably sticking in the ginseng seeds down in the ground for about 10 years, buying from Royal Action, maybe less than 10 years, usually maybe a quarter to half a pound each time. And many times I forget where I put it, but a lot of times very, very few are coming up. So the idea is improve the productivity. I've got land out in Burn Township and, uh, I want to make it better, at least, you know, something that uh, doesn't just have, uh, I don't know, uh, junk trees and stuff. <laughs> cool. Okay, uh, Jessica Miller, let's hear from you before we go on. Sure, thanks. So, um, hi, everybody. I am Jessica Miller. I'm from Northeast Ohio. I work at the Holden Arboretum with Holden Forest and Gardens. I'm the community forester there, and I... I'm interested in ginseng because we have a um, forestry demonstration area called Working Woods, and we're already doing mushroom log, um, mushroom production on logs, and some very small scale maple sugar demonstrations, um, as well as like some random medicinal plant restoration scale stuff. So ginseng is the one thing we get asked about a lot that we haven't done any sort of demonstration with. So I ordered a quarter pound this year from Real Action, and I'm excited to get that going before the ground freezes. Nice. I thought you were a different Jessica Miller, so please disregard my comment earlier, but it would be good. I was, ro I was rolling with it. There's a lot of us out there, so <laughs> not, I'm not surprised. I'll say as an aside, I think y'all should consider growing Devil's Bit, Chama, Lyrium, Ludium, but that's, that's a tale for another time. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as, as Andrea said, we're recording this. Uh, please use that raise your hand function uh, that's part of the reactions at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we'll call on you. You can also write your thing down in the chat and we'll uh, answer you at the end of the lecture. Also, I just wanna say that this is like a 101 
um, to dive deeper, I would recommend you join our organization and show up for our longer trainings. Um, you could, if you join our organization, Rural Action, uh, it would help us quite a bit. And um, you can get in line for Andrea to visit your site and help write you a site-specific non-timber forest product land management plan. Uh, also, some, there's two other orgs, at least, that would be good for you to get involved with uh, locally and regionally. That is United Plant Savers, the organization that Susan Leopold leads in Meigs County, just to the south of us. And then um, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers Coalition, um, which Rural Action is a very active participant in locally. Um, all these groups have more in-depth information. So this is sort of like a trailhead, uh, but we will have time to answer questions. So um, with that, let's just dive right in, Andrea. Cool. So um, we're just going to go ahead and get started covering the ginsengs, botany, and ecological features. I think in order to effectively cultivate this plant, it's important to have a general understanding of the plant's botany and ecology. So we're going to start with that first. Uh, ginseng is in the Aureliaceae plant family. The Aureliaceae plant, fa plant family is also called the ginseng family. Uh, generally speaking, species in this family are found in tropical regions. However, some are restricted to more temperate regions, such as American ginseng and dwarf ginseng. There are 11 species in the Panax genus, including American ginseng, Panax kinkafolius, Panax meaning cure all in terms of herbal medicine, so panacea, um, and kinkafolius for the five leaflets. All of the species in the Panax genus contain ginsenicides, which is the which are the group of saponins that are the medicinal constituents that are sought after. And the most commercially utilized plants in the Panax genus are Korean ginseng, which is going to be the ginseng that you would see in an energy drink at the gas station down the road. Uh, Korean red ginseng, which is just ginseng that's been heated and then used medicinally. And then uh, Panax kinkafolius or American ginseng. So some of the key distinguishing features of American ginseng, it has compound leaves. So if we look in that picture right there in the top right, uh, we can actually see that the plant has four leaves. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you can, this is a leaf, this is a leaf, this is a leaf, and this is a leaf. And basically just a compound leaf is a leaf that's so divided or so dissected that it looks as though it had its multiple leaves, when in reality, this is just one leaf um, and these are called leaflets and they attach all at the same location on the leaf stem here. The plant also has what's called a umbel like flower. This is a type of inflorescence. Um, it's evolutionarily advantageous for a plant to have all of its flowers in one location on the plant. Um, and these can be, you know, some plants have multiple inflorescences but ginseng just has one. So it's an umbel. All of these flowers are located in one location on the plant. This is advantageous in terms of pollination because we're increasing the likelihood um, that pollen is going to be passed from flower to flower. So ginseng is going to bloom in June through mid-July and after pollination the ovaries from the flower will ripen into seeds and produce berries. So the berries ripen from green to bright red and each berry generally contains one to two seeds. The plant grows roughly six to 18 inches tall and it's herbaceous. So this is not a woody plant, this is an herbaceous plant, meaning that it senesces each year and comes back from a rootstock that lives underground. So I just wanted to throw some pictures of some mature ginseng plants here. Um, this picture kind of really depicts that compound leaf structure I was just talking about. So if you can see my mouse, uh, this is one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, and these are consisting of five leaflets, all attached at the same point on the stalk. And then we've got that umbel right there in the middle. And here's another picture as well. It's a little bigger, blown up. Again, you can kind of see these are some green berries right here. Those will ripen into red. And then we've got our compound leaf right here on the right. And then right here, we've got a picture of those bright red berries. Really beautiful, really outstanding in the woods. Love to see them when we're out there. 
out there walking and doing, doing site assessments. Um, so ginseng is a perennial understory herb. Uh, it's typically found on north, northeast, and east facing aspects under a mature forest canopy of deciduous trees. So deciduous are, these are just trees that lose their leaves. So uh, each year, so ginseng is found in deciduous forests and it prefers north, northeast and east facing aspects under 75 to 90% shade in well-drained sites. So think about, you know, around here, north, northeast facing aspects, these have a nice slope. These allow water to pass through, pass down the slope that provides a well-drained soil for the plant. Uh, with a pH of around 5.5 to 6. So this slide basically is just covering the stage-based development of ginseng. So ginseng doesn't look the same every single year. It's going to look different. So let's say you were to go out this year and you were to plant some seeds in the following spring, if those seeds are to germinate up here in the top left corner, this is what a seedling is going to look like. So it looks strikingly different from the pictures I just showed you, um, but that's because this is a first year seedling. So it has one leaf with three separate leaflets. The following year, if everything goes well, uh, the leaf will produce two more leaflets and it will be a leaf with five leaflets. In the following year, if everything goes well, the site is a good site, uh, conditions are perfect, the plant will produce another leaf, which is called a prong. So each, each of these are called a prong. So if you ever hear of a two prong plant, three prong plant, four prong plant, this is a two prong plant, this is a three prong plant, and this is a four prong plant. So as ginseng develops through its stages of life, it produces additional prongs. Generally speaking, it won't produce more than four. However, I've talked to some people who have said they have seen a five prong plant. I personally have never seen a five prong plant, but I would love to see one. Um, so then in the third to fourth year, you know, producing that third, that third leaf, so that third prong, and then in the fourth, fourth to fifth year and, and on, uh, it's gonna be producing four prongs. So you can't necessarily use the number of prongs though to determine the age of the plant, because let's say uh, you have a four prong plant this year and it gets deer browsed, it could come back as a three prong plant next year. So let's say you're walking in the woods and you see a three prong plant next to a four prong plant, that three prong plant is not necessarily younger than the four prong plant. It just could have potentially been deer browse the year before, or really just a number of uh, external factors stressing out the plant could cause it to come back and cause it to revert into a lower pronged stage. So in terms of ginseng's native range, uh, the plant is native from Southern Canada to Northern Alabama and from the East Coast to Missouri. So if we look at that picture here in the middle of the slide, this is the range of American ginseng. If you look at this picture down here in the bottom right of the slide, this is a picture of the range of sugar maple. So as you can see, these ranges are almost exactly identical. So they have a close association with one another. Um, they're often found growing in the same sites together. And ginseng can be cultivated outside of its range, despite this native range that we see here. So people grow ginseng for a lot of reasons. Um, maybe it's economically important to you. You know, you want to make a little bit of money. Uh, maybe it's culturally important to you. You grew ginseng with your grandma or you hunted ginseng with your family, or maybe it's ecologically important. Maybe you want to um, conserve the plant because it's declining in wild populations. No matter what the reason, or maybe, maybe it's all three of these reasons combined, uh, but no matter what the reason being that you want to grow ginseng, uh, understanding the origins of the ginseng trade is really kind of what started it all. And we've got a picture down here of this guy with quite a bit of ginseng. So uh, American ginseng was used by First Nations people, but not to the extent in which, in which it is used in the Western world. So when colonists came to the United States and they saw American ginseng, they saw that it resembled uh, what Asian ginseng looked like, Panax ginseng. And the kind of a light bulb went off. And, you know, because Asian ginseng had already been a hot commodity in European markets and in, in the in the East for a very long time. So when colonists came here and saw American and ginseng, they thought, wow, we really need to uh, export this plant and market this plant. So it became one of America's first exports. And already by the late 1800s, wild populations were becoming scarce, which is really interesting to think about. You know, over 100 years, populations have been declining. Um, and people began starting to grow ginseng in uh, artificial shade conditions, 
and really started cultivating the plant. You could even buy seeds from Sears catalogs. This is a picture of an early lathe house in 1910. You can see they've got artificial shade there with the wooden, wooden boards on top. Looks like on the left there, they've got some mature ginseng plants. And then there to the right, they've got some seedling size plants. So this is a really, really intensive, intensive production system. So now we're gonna talk about growing ginseng. And there's a few different ways you can grow, gins grow ginseng, but we are gonna start with the most intensive production of ginseng. Uh, this is the field cultivated method. This is done under artificial shade. Um, it's the highest intensity, as you can see down here in this picture, this is just a monoculture of ginseng being grown in a field uh, under artificial shade. So this is a very, like I said, this is a very, very intensive form of growing ginseng. Uh, it produces the lowest value root. And because it's a monoculture and these plants are planted so close together, it's just a vector for disease. So there's a lot of chemical inputs. This type of ginseng growing is really, really treated with uh, fungicides and other chemicals that personally I really wouldn't want on my product, but uh, it, it allows for um, high production. So producing a high quantity, but I would say that the quality of these roots are definitely much lower. And this really isn't for small scale. This is for a, a commercial grower. So in terms of the woods cultivated method, this is gonna be a little less intense than field cultivated, uh, but more intense than wild simulated. Um, so this involves a significant modification of the growing site, um, including clearing all competitive understory, clearing rocks and debris from your site. And basically what you would do is you'd go into the woods and you would shallowly till the soil with a tiller, um, roughly about four inches deep, and then you would form raised beds. Um, and so in those raised beds, you would plant your ginseng. So you would scatter your seeds on top there. And then after the soil's been tilled and you've got your seeds planted, you want to top dress the beds with roughly two inches of leaf litter. And you're going to want to reapply leaf litter annually to protect this soil because you're creating raised beds. So since these aren't protected on both sides because it's a raised bed, you're going to want to add leaf litter each winter to protect it in the winter to prevent the roots and everything from freezing. Um, but you're still using natural shade. You're still using your woodlot, right? So it, you're in the woods. Um, again, this is about medium intensity on the scale. This produces roughly a mid-value root, um, and it's less maintenance intensive than field intensive than field grown, but more labor intensive than say wild simulated. Um, and if you're looking to produce seeds to provide planting stock for folks, or you're looking for roots to provide planting stock for people, this is a great way to do that. So wild simulated production, and this is generally speaking, what we recommend to most landowners we work with um, based on their av available sites. Um, this is basically mimicking wild conditions. You're going out in natural habitat, identifying a site where you would naturally find ginseng based on habitat factors. So based on the aspect, you know, which way is it facing north, northeast, east facing? Um, how steep is the site? Are there invasive species? You know, what's the understory look like? What's the overstory look like? You're taking all of these habitat factors into consideration when you're choosing your wild simulated site. Um, so in terms of intensity, this is the least labor input and it's the least acceptable to disease, right? Because you're not growing a monoculture of plants. You're doing a polyculture of plants. So when you're doing this, you're leaving the native plants. You're moving invasives. You might have to call a few trees to allow more light in there, but you're really just allowing ginseng to grow in its natural habitat, even though you're propagating it. Um, so to prepare the site, you would just remove fallen branches, rocks, and other debris. Um, you would basically just rake back the leaf litter with a soft rake. Then you would take a hard rake and kind of scarify the soil. That way you can increase the contact of the seed in the soil. And then you plant roughly five to seven seeds per square foot, and then you just cover it back up with leaf litter and you wait. So again, less intensive, no shade cloth, uh, no fungicide, no, no chemicals, anything like that. Um, this method probably is the most vulnerable to, yes, Badger? I would just add, we've had a good time recently um, using a leaf blower instead of a soft rake. So if you have a carpal tunnel or um, if you have a leaf blower, um, you might make use of it to Put, put uh, take the leaves off the plot that you want to plant, and then after you scarify the ground with the hard rake and uh, broadcast the seeds, you can use the um, leaf blower to put the leaves back on. 
So labor saving device. Yeah, we actually planted seeds yesterday using the leaf blower method and it was very, very effective. So if you have a large site um, and you don't have the capacity to rake back all that leaf litter, the leaf blower would be the way to go. Um, so in terms of uh, wild simulated production, it's vulnerable to poaching um, because you know, you're just growing ginseng in a remote area in your woods. And it does take roughly seven to 10 years for you to be able to harvest. So you're really not gonna be harvesting for at least seven years. Uh, the older the root, the slightly bigger it is and the more medicinal it is. Um, but these roots look exactly like wild roots. So, you know, compar comparatively speaking, uh, wild roots and wild simulated roots look pretty much the same. So they're still bringing in that high market value the same way a wild harvested root would. And in terms of the price per pound, it's highly variable, but roughly $350 to $1,500 a pound, depending on uh, the way the root looks and the size. So these different methods are going to yield different results. Right here on the left, we've got a four-year-old woods cultivated root. As you can see, it's pretty big, uh, kind of looks like a carrot. You know, you've tilled the soil, you've given it space to grow, it's been aerated, um, you're kind of babying it versus that wild simulated root there on the right is more wild looking. And that's an eight to 10 year old wild simulated root on the right. So you can really see the difference here. Um, but when we think of medicinal plants and medicinal constituents, you know, plants produce medicinal constituents, also known as secondary metabolites, in response to an environmental stressor. So when you think about a plant that's been babied versus a plant that's been grown in the wild, wild plants are going to have a higher concentration of those medicinal constituents because they've been allowed to thrive in the wild and produce those constituents in response to some natural environmental stressor. Um, when you're growing plants in maybe a shade house or in more of like a cultivated like setting, there's going to be less stress on the plant inherently, just based on that production method. So again, wild simulated roots are going to bring a lot more money, but the wait time is much longer. So in terms of seeds, we generally recommend folks plant seeds versus buying dormant bare roots. Uh, you can buy dormant bare roots, that's totally fine, but if you're planting a whole hillside or planting a really large area or you want more bang for your buck, seeds are definitely the way to go. Um, but you're going to want to make sure you buy stratified seeds. And basically all that means is that uh, ginseng seeds, when they ripen on the plant, they don't quite yet have a functional embryo. So when they fall on the ground, they require 18 more months of stratification before they're able to germinate. And stratification just means exposure to fluctuating seasonal temperatures. So when you buy ginseng seed, you're always gonna to wanna to buy stratified because let's say you buy a seed that's unstratified, you go ahead and plant it this fall, it's not gonna germinate for 18 months. So that's a really large window uh, for a number of things to go wrong. So a lot of variables. So stratification does not equal germination, right? So stratification will definitely increase your chances of having a productive planting, but it doesn't guarantee germination. Germination happens when the conditions are right and the seed is ready. So uh, when the spring comes after 18 months of stratification, uh, the seed's going to say, okay, it's warming up, I'm going to germinate. But to get there, it's a whole process. So again, always buy stratified seeds if you're purchasing seeds. Um, in terms of price and quality, this is highly variable. One thing you're going to want to look for when you do purchase seeds, you're going to want to make sure they're plump. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have that white kernel sticking out. If you can see my mouse, you can see this embryo kind of starting to come out of the seed casing. Uh, that is called, referred to as smiling. So if your seeds are smiling, that's good. It means they're ready to plant. Um, you can also do a what's called a float test. So if you put your seeds in water and your seeds sink, that means they're good. The ones that float, you're gonna wanna get rid of those because they're probably not viable. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Badger. All right. Thank you, Andrea. That was really good. Um, let's see. Yeah, so growing conditions, site. Am I frozen? Can you hear me? You are frozen. Okay. I can hear you now. Great. Okay. So um, there's a lot of things to consider here. So let's first talk about uh, obstacles to uh, successfully raising ginseng in the woods using the wild simulated method. Um, you know, a lot like mo all of the land 
question mark. Most of the land in Ohio has been uh, severely degraded in one way or the other uh, over the course of uh, colonization. Um, whether it was in row crops and it was uh, drained or if it's been repeatedly clear cut or exploitatively uh, selectively harvest either way, um, whether the ground that you're standing on is actually a pile of mine spoils. All of these things uh, will impact um, sort of the site index for ginseng. And, you know, I'll say you want, uh, you want a gnarly looking twisted up old root um, to sell uh, for the highest price per pound. But also within that limitation, you want your ginseng to grow as healthy and fast as possible. So growing uh, where there's a hard pan and water pools on the surface of the soil isn't going to work. Growing um, somewhere where there's no organic matter or the soil is too low in calcium isn't going to work. Um, so just to say, you know, soil quality matters. Also invasive species, um, you know, I don't know how many of you uh, go out and hike um, sort of off the beaten trail on old skitter trails, but uh, Japanese stilt grass, for instance, um, can come in on equipment, logging equipment, it can travel um, anywhere where the soil's uh, been disturbed and there's enough light and it will crowd out something like ginseng pretty effectively. Um, so you want to uh, find an area that uh, is not is either not too thick with invasives or where you can successfully treat those invasives and um, largely eliminate them. Uh, you know, ginseng grows fine with native sedges. Uh, it grows great with as a companion plant with golden seal. Um, but uh, you don't want really aggressive um, species that uh, are, are leliopathic and releasing, you know, chemicals through their root exates uh, that inhibit the growth of other species. So, for instance, um, another species that really likes calcium in the soil is Lanicera macchiae, uh, which is one of the three species of invasive honeysuckles in this state. Um, excuse me, maybe one of the four, one of the three bush honeysuckles that's invasive here. And uh, you need to get rid of that stuff before you plant ginseng in a site. Um, at the very least, it can't occupy the space where you're actually putting the seeds. And it would be better if you could eliminate any nearby seed sources. Um, next slide, please. So uh, generally, uh, what's best for growing ginseng quickly and efficiently is, um, uh, you know, the same thing that grows timber the fastest. We're talking about protected aspects, um, protected from the noonday sun during the droughty part of the summer is what we're saying. So north and east facing slopes. Uh, you might think they would be north facing slopes like evenly, but actually the hottest part of the day is not noon, it's later in the afternoon when the sun is more in the southwest. Um, so there's that. Generally, you want that protected aspect if you want the um, ginseng to grow the fastest. You know, this is a shade tolerant plant. Obviously, it's not, it, it depends on chlorophyll for all of its um, ATP needs on a cellular level, but uh, it doesn't compete well with um faster growing uh grasses let's say and it becomes photo inhibited uh, when there's too much light uh, so um while it is beneficial to have some light and like a completely closed canopy um is not going to grow the fastest ginseng if you um you know you need more than um, a little bit of shade to grow this successfully, uh, which is why they put up this heavy shade cloth when they do it in uh, high tunnels, right? Um, so some good uh, companion plants in the overstory that you might look for. Uh, a really good one is sugar maple because that's another indicator that there is some 
uh, adequate amount of calcium in the soil. Not to say that the soil is alkaline when you see sugar maple, um, but there's going to be a fair amount of calcium there, or else sugar maple is not going to grow. You'd see red maple instead. Um, uh, poplar, you know, uh, uh, people call it tulip poplar, people call it yellow poplar, depending on whether you are a uh, timber person or an ecology person, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, American beech, uh, ash used to be something that uh, co-occurred. Um, and uh, not so much anymore. I will say that blue ash is also a calcophile. And um, that if you see blue ash, it's probably a good indicator that you can grow ginseng there. Uh, buckeye, um, yellow buckeye in particular, um, anywhere on a back slope where there's a bunch of yellow buckeye, you can expect to see ginseng growing. Uh, northern red oak, uh, people sometimes imagine that ginseng and oak is not, are not compatible, but red oak loves the same sites as ginseng. And then uh, black walnut. Um, black walnut likes uh, mesic, that is to say moist soil, um, likes uh, enough calcium. It needs to be well drained. Um, so, and then there's a bunch of understory plant indicators. And I will say this, uh, if you see all these other beautiful medicinal herbs growing in a space, um, it's a good indication that you could grow ginseng. However, the absence of those uh, is not necessarily an indicator that is a bad site for ginseng because um, there's lots of things that might have destroyed uh, the seed bank in any given area, uh, cows in the woods in an unmanaged way, um, you know, uh, some erosion due to clear cutting, um, these kind of things uh, can all wipe out the understory indicators. But if you see them, you know that ginseng would be at home. And some of those species include, you know, Solomon seal, Christmas fern, uh, bloodroot, blue cohosh, black cohosh, ramps. Um, I'm very fond of ramps. So, uh, and you can grow all these things together. Uh, also, you know, the understory, you don't want, uh, just because you need shade, the roots of the ginseng need growing space. And um, uh, this means that you don't want uh, a bunch of, you know, shrubs uh, uh, interrupting the um, absorption of nutrients by the ginseng. So if it's not already open, you're gonna need to prune or eliminate the shrub layer from that area. Um, I shouldn't say that as an absolute statement. Sometimes people will grow ginseng under a big uh, multi-floor rose or something like that uh, to protect it from deer. Um, but in general, uh, shrubs are counterindicated. Um, we should talk about security for a minute. Uh, poaching from root diggers is a risk, um, as is browsing from deer. And uh, you should have a plan uh, and Andrea uh, or I could help you think through what your plan is for mitigating both of those risk factors. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, uh, you, 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 know, you should grow on a site that matches this description. It might be a shelf on a different uh, uh, aspect again. Um, so if you have a shelf, uh, on a West facing slope, you might actually see some of the understory plants. If it's a big enough shelf, um, uh, because there's enough deep enough soil, enough soil moisture, uh, that you could grow ginseng there. And that can be a good way to, um, to go as well. Um, you also should probably grow it far enough away from the forest edge. Uh, that, um, you know, deer aren't going to be passing through there uh, constantly. If you keep it off of the normal routes of deer, then you're going to um, reduce deer browse. Does all that make sense? 
Okay, I'm seeing some nodding. Um, so site preparation. Uh, wow, somebody's called me like 10 times in the last five minutes. Wow. Um, they're they're going to have to call me back. Um, yeah, so you want to remove. Um, we're talking about uh, sort of wild simulated ginseng. So we're not like intensively farming this, even though we're picking site that's going to be really ideal and has a bunch of the good growing conditions. Um, but we are going to modify the environment somewhat in a way that won't reduce the market value of this root. So, uh, you know, if these are invasive shrubs, get them out of there. If these are spice bush berries um, or pawpaws or something, you might prune them back or mechanically or remove them. I would not uh, treat those with herbicide. And frankly, I wouldn't uh, advise you to treat uh, invasive species in your forest farming uni units with herbicide either. Um, I'd focus on mechanical harvest. And that's just because um, even though there's no, yeah, people are very sensitive to the quality of the product that they're buying. And people can test, you know, that if, if they're paying $600 a pound for your roots, they can probably afford to send a sample off to a lab to see if you were spraying a bunch of um, nasty chemicals on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, I see a couple of questions have come up here. I'm just gonna make sure that these have been, have been addressed. Understory indicators again. Um, yeah, there's lots of them, you know, classically we're talking about like cove, uh, mesic cove species. Um, again, um, you don't need to see those things for it to be a good ginseng site because a lot of places have been so degraded that you just won't see uh, an intact, um, slow growing perennial herb community. But um, when these things are there, um, it's a good indication because they need, because they need, and the reason that is, is not necessarily because there's like a mystical symbiosis between all these plants, it's because they all need the same or similar uh, site conditions to succeed. Though I will say golden seal is uh, antiseptic and it also um, anecdotally people seem to think that it might uh, uh, help treat some of the sort of fungal diseases that overly densely planted ginseng seed or ginseng plants can get. Okay, I'm going to answer this and tell this person to stop calling me, sorry. Hello? <laughs> Hello. Jesus Christ. All right, it's just a bot. Um, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so individual planting methods. Yeah, we uh, generally, we're not mechanically planting this. Um, we uh, broadcast the seed. Um, you want really good seed to soil contact. Uh, and that is why we rake up the ground and disturb the soil a little bit before we broadcast, and then why we might rake it again after we broadcast. Um, uh, and, you know, you could jam individual seeds in the ground. You know, each one of those at our current price is about one and a half cents. Uh, if you buy them from somebody else, it might be seven cents a seed. So. Um, it makes sense to try and maximize the germination rate of these things. Uh, it also makes sense to get the spacing such that it's uh, uh, around uh, the terminal spacing of the plants that you want. So like, I don't want more, more than one plant growing in a square foot, you know. Um, and if there's nine square feet in a, in a, a square yard, I probably don't want more than seven uh, ginseng plants in that square yard. You know, they need a little bit of elbow room because we're going to try and let these uh, grow big enough to um, get some weight on them and they grow slowly. And uh, as above, so below, the, the four prongers are going to be take up some space um, when the roots get that big. Okay, Jessica Miller, you've raised your hand. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, just wondering for direct sowing, are we pressing that seed into the ground, covering it with anything? Is that enough to have seed soil contact or should it be put at a certain depth? 
Uh, have you ever um, planted a food plot for deer hunting? Personally, no. Well, you know, you wouldn't be remiss at using like a ATV cultipacker. Um, but when we rake a second time after we have uh, scattered the seed, that is the point to kind of mix the soil in a little bit. Um, and these are remote enough, small enough sites that, you know, you can't get really tractor implements back there to do any cult packing, even if. Uh, walk on it. I mean, yeah, I, I have done that on a very small scale, a little more labor intensive than I like. Um, but yeah, pressing the seed, getting the seed into the soil is super helpful. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see here. We talked a little bit about uh, Paul's concern that his previous uh, ginseng uh, seed planting efforts had not been as successful as he'd like. And um, if you get really good seed uh, that's that's all been stratified for one year and is ready to stratify for the necessary second season before uh, fully germinates, um, then uh, you should have good germination luck. But sometimes ginseng can be tricky. And so uh, if you've got a relatively small forest uh, and you've got a relatively smaller uh, patch of ideal habitat that you want to plant in, you could plant up to you know five to seven seeds per square foot. Um, if you just if you wanted to ensure that all that space was filled in, um, so uh, yeah, there, there's a range. Um, you know, I, the more the more care that you take to ensure that each individual seed germinates, uh, the less dense you would have to plant. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here we have Karim, our uh, director of our sustainable forestry program, and Andrea giving discourse on uh, planting these things. You can see they're coming in dog hair thick. Uh, uh, really, honestly, that's too thick for my book um, uh, in the bottom left of the panel. Um, but that's a good problem to have. You know, you could always. Um, dig them up and replant them uh, after they're dormant. Uh, if you if, if you have way more germination than you thought you would. Um, and you know, here they've got the soft rake and the hard rake. Uh, those are pretty simple tools that a lot of people would have on hand, the leaf blower too. Um, so this keeps it very simple. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, we talked about invasive species. Uh, Andrea talked a little bit about alternaria leaf blights, but uh, you can see spots on the leaves uh, when they get this. And then, you know, if the roots are touching another ginseng plant, the next ginseng plant will get it and such, which is why for me, um, ginseng uh, with such a high, high density planting, uh, if the germination is going to be um, really successful, uh, that might be too dense. For a terminal species, spacing. Um, yeah, the uh, root rot, um, you don't want that. It's going to be so disappointing that if you waited for uh, a decade to dig these things up and you um, dig them up and they've turned to glop. Um, uh, in terms of weeding, you know, uh, I will say this sometimes native species. Uh, herb species could be competing with the ginseng. Um, and you'll see this, you know, if you have removed a bunch of invasives, which were allelopathic, you know, preventing the germination and thriving of like native understory plants. And then you like lightly disturb the soil uh, to sort of wake up the seed bank inadvertently, you might get a bunch of bloodroot or trillium or something germinating in your ginseng plot. Uh, and again, you know, those aren't bad plants. You could uh, dig those up and plant them outside the plot. Um, 
certainly if you get something aggressive like stilt grass, you're going to want to rip all that up. Um, and then, yeah, keep an eye out for predators, uh, uh, human and human and otherwise. Uh, everything likes ginseng. Um, so uh, some of the most interesting and dense wild populations of ginseng I've seen have been on like, re like uh, really inaccessible sites where like the deer never go. Um, just like some of the just like some of them have been um on aspects or, or locations that you wouldn't expect um because poachers you know they're going to go to the nicest growing spot first you know they know where people want to plant these things so anything you can do to fake out the deer or the poachers is, is a good thing next slide please uh laws and regulations um, this, this is funny, right? Because this is like, we're growing it like corn almost, but it's also a federally endangered species. So there's like a little bit of laws that you should know about if you're going to be growing this. Uh, CITES is an international treaty. Um, uh, it's listed on, ginseng is listed on uh, Appendix 2, uh, which means it is legal to harvest, but it has to be regulated by all the signatory countries, which is like most of the countries in the world um uh, strangely enough it's the u.s fish and wildlife service um at the federal level that oversees this and they um yeah they keep track of any like legally harvested and sold uh, ginseng um they issue the export permits to uh you know the mostly chinese buyers um because like there'll be like a root buyer and then they'll work with somebody who exports it. And then that exporter will sell ginseng at auction. And then the person who buys that will distribute it throughout China or, you know, see no influence uh, places that like to buy expensive ginseng. Um, you're supposed to dig up wild plants that are uh, five years old and have at least three prongs, which is common sense because, uh, they're not very big if you don't wait at least that long. And we might even say that you should wait uh, 10 to 12 years to get the most bang for your buck. Um, it's nice if the thing is producing seeds that you can replant, so you don't have to keep buying ginseng seed from rural action when you harvest it. Um, yeah. uh, so states are required as usual with wildlife law in the US to develop their own sort of administrative code on this. Um, and that involves licensing uh, ginseng buyers or dealers or whatever you want to call them, including our friend Chip Carroll, who works for United Plant Savers. He'll buy, he's happy to buy all your ginseng and sell it to um, Chinese buyers. And uh, uh, the state also uh, establishes a harvest season, the collection protocol and compiles harvest data um ohio is one of 19 states that uh does this and it's not all the states right because there's no there's no mesic cove habitat in utah um that's why it's not all 50 states right next slide please uh so in ohio uh here's the harvest season uh we're in the middle of it um you know usually you go out and harvest it if you were a poacher, you go out when the ginseng starts to yellow up um, because it yellows up before most other things and that's how you can spot it. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're a ginseng farmer, you might actually go and remove the uh, tops of the plant when they yellow up so nobody poaches it. And then you can harvest them whenever you want. Um, and you can oftentimes, you know, people go in and harvest a whole bed at once. Um, and if you, you know, wanted to do this as a business and, uh, you know, make $20,000 a year to subsidize your uh, social security or something, um, you could, you know, plant five pounds a year. And then in 12 years, uh, you dig up the first round that you planted and just sort of, it's sort of like uh, rotational grazing or you know, so-called scientific forest management where you've 
got a bunch of different age classes of the forage or wood, in this case, the ginseng. Um, yeah, I think the laws uh, require you to replant the seed. Um, and that's a good thing. I don't know if people actually do that, but uh, if you're forest farming, it just makes sense. Oh, and right, uh, they, they regulate, they treat ginseng, uh, American ginseng, the species, the same, whether you're growing it or you're wild harvesting it. So in effect, the law in Ohio says, if you're wild harvesting it, you have to forest farm it because you have to replant the seed. I think that's interesting, you know? So Bob Bafis has argued that uh, given that regulation, wild, wild ginseng doesn't really exist anymore, but uh, um, we don't want to say that too loudly because the wildness of it is part of the mystique that uh, gets the high dollar. Um, uh, if, if you are uh, harvesting a private land that's not yours, obviously you need landowner permission, not allowed to take it from state parks. Uh, if you're taking it from uh, forest service land, um, you, it requires a permit. I've done that before. It's like $25. Um, the National Park Service, uh, superintendent to superintendent, depending on the park you're at, uh, laws are different. Cuyahoga Valley National Park, you're not allowed to harvest roots. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we talked about the dealers being licensed. Uh, you can't sell dried ginseng before it could have conceivably be, been uh, harvested and dried. Um, they're trying to basically prevent people from harvesting it before it's possible to replant the seed, if that makes sense. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Um, yeah, if you're trying to age this thing, you know, it's um, maybe not a completely 100% reliable uh, metric, but it's pretty reliable. This little neck thing, uh, this little thing that is like above the main root, it's got uh nodes that you can count um sort of like rings on a tree and you know you can dig up a ginseng root i mean there's precious few out there right but you can dig one up and be like wow this thing is more than a century old you know and it's part of the mystique of it being associated with longevity is this and the plants when they get that old they get humongous um you know i've had seen ginseng up to my knee and this old timer told me that he planted it 50 years ago, like on the perfect site. I'm like, this thing, I cannot believe how big this is. Um, I desperately wanted to dig it up and eat it, but I, I held off. Um, yeah, anybody, any questions about the physiology there? Just, I think that's a beautiful slide, Andrea. Maybe you could go back to it. Any, any questions about this particular slide? Is that everybody seen? A ginseng root and they you know they can appreciate how long this thing must have been alive by seeing how long its neck is okay next slide then so marketing it um there's more and more of this being uh harvested uh because more and more of it is being forest farmed or de facto forest farm because people have lawfully been replanting the seeds from so-called wild ginseng. Um, the prices of this stuff fluctuate quite a bit. Right now, they're pretty low uh, in terms of the historical range. So, you know, <laughs> if you're a ginseng grower, uh, assuming that you're in, in, the, in the intervening season, um, the deer, the poachers don't get it. If the price is low, just leave it in the ground another year, you know, accrue more mass and uh, wait till the price is up. That's my advice. Um, little, little plug for uh, going deeper on this journey with us. You know, we're a nonprofit. We're selling the seed uh, at cost. We buy it um, in bulk and resell it. Um, you know, there's people selling it for almost five times as much as we are commercially. Um, uh, the point of doing this is to um, lower the barriers for entry to people doing this as part of their um, retirement strategy. Um, so, you know, 
if you do everything you can, if you step on the seeds, like people have proposed here, uh, 7,000 seeds in a pound, that's a lot, you know, if you got 80% um, germination on that and you were able to harvest all those, uh, that is a lot of ginseng in one pound. Um, so I think it, uh, I think it makes sense to really dote on these things. You're not allowed to fertilize them. You know, you're not allowed to till the soil, but uh, making sure that each seed that you can germinates and makes it to uh, economic, economically mature age is a really good idea. And um, could be that part of the reason the price is down this year is because we sold so much seed that uh, people are finally really getting into this. Um, what factors make the root price fluctuate so much? So let's, let me ask you this. Uh, has anything happened in the last decade uh, where the trade relationship between America and China has fluctuated and it's, you know, yes, lots of things have impacted that, right? Uh, there's tariffs, um, there's like trade wars, uh, there's, you know, what is it? Isolationism versus neoliberalism, depending on who's in the administration. So um, all that impacts uh, this stuff. Um, so harvesting roots, we talked about minimum five years, 10 years uh, is much better. Um, and you know, th there's a, people want a root that looks like a human being, like a whole body. You know, they want, well, they want something that looks like it's got a head, a neck. for everything, it like staves off old age. And if your blood pressure is too high, it lowers it. But if it's too low, it raises it. It's like this magical cure all according to the Chinese pharmacopoeia. And so um, uh, it's a pretty rare root that actually looks like a, like a doll, um, like I was describing, but like one of those man roots, um, if it's the right shape, uh, could sell for, you know, a thousand dollars or more just for one root. Okay. Even if it only weighs, you know, 0 0.05 pounds. Um, but it takes a while for something to get like that. So um, don't dig it up at age five, please. It's that's, that would be a ridiculous management choice. Um, I don't hit or damage the roots, you know, you need that whole neck intact for the aesthetic appeal of the root, um, because when the root the, from when the root buyer buys it from the root dealer, and then goes and tries to sell it at auction in Hong Kong, uh, they're going to be there's going to be people who are professional ginseng buyers who are looking for the most aesthetically pleasing root, and that you know the value to those people uh, is going to reflect how carefully you dug these roots up. Um, uh, don't break the neck. Um, so first you wanna you know, go off to the side of the root and loosen the soil uh, with some kind of hand tool. Um, I know Andrea and Tanner like using a hand mattock. Um, so like a short handled thing with three prongs on one side to kind of loosen the root. Uh, and then finishing dusting it off by hand and uh, keeping any little rootlets that are coming off of it, like the arm, possible arms or legs, you wanna keep those intact. They get very wispy at the end. You want as much of that wispiness as possible. Not that it adds a lot of weight, mind you, but it adds to the aesthetic value for the like people at the auction. Um, washing and drying, I'll give a plug for Sustainable Forestry's upcoming uh, program in the next year. Uh, we are going to be starting an herb hub uh, based off of the model from Appalachian Sustainable Development. And this is gonna be a place where you can uh, bring all your ginseng roots um, and I'm gonna eat them all. Now, we're gonna, you're gonna be able to process them and uh, uh, you're gonna be able to meet with 
uh, root buyers who will have to post their prices publicly. Uh, so, you know, maybe they compete with each other a little bit and you get a better price. Um, so sort of a processing aggregation distribution site. Sorry going along with real actions, typical strategy these days, which is finding gaps in the value train locally and filling it. Uh, yes, Paul. It sounds like it's a beauty contest almost. It is. Okay. It is. And uh, you get extra credit for wrinkles, you know, as much as I like eating those big carrot ginseng from under the shade cloth, uh, I don't have the Chinese sensibility about me. Um, um, Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a Philistine. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't want to overwash the uh, the root. You want a little dirt on there. Um, you can soak it briefly in water and then gently rub off the dirt. And this is partially, you know, this is, I think this is very scientifically defensible actually, because a lot of the chemicals, um, the ginsengicides and the coenzyme Q10 and whatever else is happening in there. It, it like ginseng hyperaccumulates molybdenum, you know, it's like a, there's a bunch of like weird chemistry to this plant. Um, a lot of that is in the root bark, you know, it's not in like the starch in the middle of the root. So um, please handle with care. Uh, you want to dry it on a screen in the dark, you know, you don't want to photodegrade this thing. Um, uh, it needs to be dry. If, you, if it's not dry uh, on the screen in the dark, it's going to get moldy and that will not sell. Um, good airflow and temperature, uh, you know, warm but not hot. Um, it's a slow process. Um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, and yeah, watch for molding or spoilage. If you uh, pack these things into the dryer too tightly and you see some mold develop, uh, take the moldy roots out and dispose of them and spread them out a little bit more widely. Does that make sense? Um, it's supposed to be the 101, but we're packing in as much as we can here. Uh, next slide. Yeah, people uh, buy them both fresh and dry. Um, uh, Again, more of the red tape. Whoever is licensed and buying the roots from you can help you navigate this. Uh, you know, given that the prices fluctuate year to year, I would say don't sell your ginseng root if you've been growing it for 10 years for, for less than $500 a pound. Wait till another year. Um, uh, oftentimes the prices fluctuate over the course of time and they might peak around uh, Thanksgiving. Um, not really sure why that is, but that's just uh, what you can see if you keep track of those things. Um, and uh, if you're trying to sell some uh, smaller roots, it's great to mix them in with some bigger roots and make them buy all the roots together so they don't try and just cherry pick your best looking roots. Um, and yeah, there's value added products. If you don't feel like dealing with all this, you know, you can sell tincture, you can sell tea, you can sell powder, you know. If you're more of a chemistry minded uh, American, you could just drink tea with the leaves because the same chemicals are in the leaves. But if you're trying to sell to the Chinese market, then uh, it's mostly about selling the carefully harvested and dried roots. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, honestly, if I were to try and sell anybody ginseng, uh, who, who I'm American, I would try and sell it to them fresh um, because I think there's a bunch of potency that's lost in the drying process. But, you know, Chinese, Chinese uh, pharmacists will take the dried root and then they'll, they'll, depending on what disease they're trying to treat, or condition they're trying to treat the like fried in vinegar or fried in wine or fried in honey. There's all these like um, elemental correspondences to how they prepare these things, um, which is why they want like a raw ingredient that they can use for lots of different things. The tea is very nice. That's a very distinct flavor. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Andrea, do you want to say anything about more about value added products here? Because you've, you've been in the game a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just basically going off of what Badger said, um, tinctures, great value added product is tinctures where you just use alcohol as a solvent to extract and preserve the medicinal constituents of a plant. Uh, you can dry the roots, cut and sift them to be used as a tea or like a decoction. Um, and then, yeah, you could just dry it and powder it too. And you could put those powders in capsules or you can sell the powder whole for people to put in smoothies and in foods like oatmeal and other things like that. And then also what Badger said was a growing market for leaves. So the leaves do contain some ginsenicides. However, the concentration is not as high as in the root, but they're in the leaves for sure. And if you were growing a bunch of ginseng and let's say you had a four prong plant and it wasn't quite ready to harvest, but you wanted to use some ginseng, you could go take one of those leaves off of the, off of the plant. Don't, don't take all of them because that's going to damage the plant, right? It'll probably come back as a three prong plant next year because you're uh, preventing it from being able to fully photosynthesize and store uh, nutrients in its root to come back the next year as a four prong, but you could totally just take a leaf off of a few plants and then use that to make a tea. And it's really delicious. And like Badger said, it has a very distinct taste. Taste, um, It's really good. And there is a growing market for that. There's a, being a lot of work done by some players in the, in the forest farming world to kind of gear the market more towards leaf harvests and uh, leaf production in the interim um, to relieve pressure from wild populations. So that concludes the presentation. We'll have some time for q and I know we're a little bit over the noon mark, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And we can answer any questions that anyone has. But first applause. Great job, Andrea, great job. Good job. Thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, so it looks like there's some stuff in the chat. We can go through that. Let me see, I can just start at the beginning here. Uh, I think Badger already repeated the understory indicators, um, but we can reiterate that again to uh, plants like trillium, blue cohosh, uh, maidenhair fern, Christmas fern, Solomon seal, spice bush, tulip poplar, uh, sugar maple, red maple, or sorry, not red maple, red oak, Please disregard red maple, red oak. Oh, wow, someone posted them there. All right, let's see. Doo, doo, doo. Yeah, so that was a rattlesnake fern in that picture. It was not Christmas fern, rattlesnake fern, uh, which is also known um, culturally as sang pointer. Um, some old folks will say it points to ginseng, which that can be the case. I have seen that, but it also just likes the exact same habitat. So it often can point to ginseng, but that's because they like the same habitat factors. Um, let's see. Yes. What time of year do you plant seeds? You plant seeds now. So uh, anytime from late summer, pretty much clear until the ground freezes. Most literature that's out there will say uh, when about a third of the leaf litter has dropped. However, there's been some emerging research coming out of Penn State, I believe, saying that you can actually plant the seeds clear until the ground freezes. Um, and the benefits of that are you are giving that seed less time for exposure to predators and things that could go wrong. So we we planted here last year clear into December um, because it's been I plant I planted in January and it's been great. You know, if you're covering them back up with leaves and they're insulated from getting frozen and desiccated you know, any time until it thaws, really. Mm -hmm. um, but you do want it to be stratifying in the soil for what, the 30 days or 60 days? I forget. I think 30 like probably. 60 would be fine, but minimum of 30. Um, and then, you know, if you do, the longer you do wait to plant, you know, just make sure you're really inspecting your seed. So if it's been in your fridge, so when you get your seed, you're going to store it in the fridge until you're ready to plant. You're going to want to make sure it's not moldy, doesn't smell bad. Um, if it's starting to germinate, it's fine to plant. Um, I think the success could be decreased, but if, you know, if it's really starting to germinate, just go ahead and plant it. I think it's fine. I remember last year we got some seed donated to us from somebody. I don't remember where it came from. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But we opened it and it just like filled the whole room with a terrible smell. And we planted it and none of it germinated. So it was, it was just bad seed. Um, so just make sure when you get your ginseng seed, and again, the longer you wait, just be sure to check it, make sure it's not moldy and make sure it's not dried out. We will uh, treat our seed in the fridge. We have like a spray bottle that we have water in. And if we look in there and it's starting to get dry, we'll just give it a few squirts, kind of work it around in the bag with our hands to make sure moisture is coming into contact with all of the seeds. You don't want to put iodine, you don't want to put alcohol, but uh, putting some, um, you know, antiseptic over the counter uh, hydrogen peroxide solution on the seeds is not going to hurt them and it is going to prevent or discourage anyway uh, mold. So um, if you're worried about that, I'd say hydrogen peroxide is your friend. Cool. And then I think the last question was just what factors make the root price fluctuate so much, but I think Badger, you touched on that when you were presenting. So I think we're good there. Um, does anybody else have any further questions? Bye Shane. Any other deer protection tips? I mean, you can put up deer fencing. People do this. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's a bad idea. Uh, obviously, you're gonna have to maintain deer fence if you may, if you get the like really cheap plastic stuff that looks like it's something you bought from Aldi's. Um, it's gonna get shredded by fallen branches. Um, so, yeah, if you're gonna grow like a, if you're going to grow ginseng a large quantity as like a financial investment picked out an isolated spot with good growing conditions. Um, you have uh, you or someone that you're paying or trust to keep an eye on it, to keep poachers out. Um, you know, you could invest in deer fencing. Um, if you're growing a small amount, uh, I think it would really make sense to try and find a place that's far enough from the forest edge to not have a bunch of deer walking through there. And um, that requires larger unbroken tracts of forested land. Um, and uh, while, you know, I, I'll just point out, right? If you are harvesting ginseng, you're required to um, plant the seeds. Um, you can't get a permit to do forest farming on the Wayne National Forest, but, you know, uh, if you're required to forest farm it there anyway, de facto, you could go into the most remote place you could possibly find there and grow some ginseng. It wouldn't be legally defensively yours, right? You couldn't put up a fence, but that's like another option if you don't have a place where you think it'll be safe from deer and you don't wanna put up a fence. Um, One thing too that I think Bob Bifus has recommended is surrounding your plantings with chicken wire just flat on the ground. Um, I believe the idea behind that is that deer won't walk on it because it's like kind of uneven and they kind of can't see their feet in a sense. Um, so that could be something potentially to try. Oh yeah, someone just said that. Cool. I'm loving these questions. Anything else? I see Paul has raised their hand. Um, you mentioned uh, actually trying to grow it under multi-floor rows. Is that something to actually try doing? I know it's gnarly enough that we keep animals out, some animals out, and some people out. Right. I mean, I've seen ginseng growing in an area with a lot of deer traffic under snarled up tangles of, you know, rose bush. So um, I don't like that, but I'm going <laughs> to grow a little bit for personal consumption or something and you don't have the right habitat, you could use uh, the thorns to your advantage. Um, uh, I would take out the shrubs. Uh, I would take out the stilt grass. I would take out the Japanese honeysuckle vine, but um, blackberry, uh, native blackberry, uh, smilax, you know, green briar, or even multi-floor rows like these are all things that make it difficult for the deer to pass through and they'd probably rather go around so 
the other two things is how um, how how deep uh, when they talk about intensive gardening, they're talking about uh, digging four or five inches down into the soil. It looks like when you're doing it in a wild situation, the soil is not that is that the case? Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd plant ginseng more than like a quarter inch deep. Um, uh, when you compare it to like the size of a kidney bean, it's not a huge seed. Um, it's not a tiny seed, but um, yeah, uh, lightly covered with soil, but that's it. Okay, and you mentioned uh, calcium being an, an essential ingredient to a soil amendment. Um, is how critical is that? I mean, you know. There's uh, some really good studies. Um, uh, there's a really good study from Quebec uh, that looked at uh, soil nutrient levels and um, the production of some of these calcifitic herbs. And, you know, the soil with the calcium in it grew much bigger herbs. Um, and it needs to be like rocky enough where the thing is struggling for life a little bit, but um, you don't want it to be starved of calcium and struggling against the rocks you know, um, because it really won't do well. Um, and yeah, like a, if you tilled up or disked up, like I, you could get a, uh, you could get a BCS tractor. I'm very fond of those and get a rotary plow and a tiller attachment and you can make really nice beds. Um, and that's basically what the forest cultivated people do. Um, I think, I think forest cultivated ginseng is mostly sold to American markets, um, in value added products and not the export Chinese market. And, um, Elise Gerhardt. Yeah. So if you amend the soil, it will, um, the root buyers will, uh, not accept it as wild ginseng. That's sort of the lesson. So if you, if you want to do the Chinese market, then you need to not amend the soil. All you can do is through site selection, pick somewhere where there's enough soil nutrients and, you know, get a soil test if, you, if you're not sure. Um, I love soil testing. But if, if you're growing it for yourself, like let's say you just want to make yourself tea or you want to make yourself tinctures, um, you could amend the soil, that would be fine. Okay. Well, thank you. Good day. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Please go ahead and join Roll Action. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Thank you.